Great. Hi. Welcome to the PD Bytes St. Louis School Library Year in Review. I'm your host, Shannon Steimel, Future Ready Librarian at Live for Life Academy. And I'd like to introduce you to my two special guest hosts today, uh, Victoria. Hi, I'm Victoria Jones. I'm the coordinator for district libraries in the school district of Clayton. I'm also the librarian at Wydown Middle School. And this year I was the advocate of the year for the St. Louis, Greater St. Louis School Librarians. Wonderful. It's quite an honor. <laughs> Hi, and I'm Alicia Landers. I'm the Director of Curriculum Technology for the Melville School District. Thank you. So first up today, we're talking with Tom Bober, who is a librarian here in the St. Louis area and also the author of a book on using primary so sources. Welcome, Tom. Hi, glad to be here. Hi, Tom. Thanks for joining us. So um, to start out, we'd like to know what really first got you interested in um, using primary sources with your kids. I was really interested in using primary sources from back when I first started as a classroom teacher, which was years ago. Um, but I found out very early on that I didn't have any idea how to use them. I brought them into my classroom and they just fell flat. So the first uh, inkling to kind of get me figuring out how to actually bring these historical documents into my library uh, years later was a week-long professional development opportunity at the Library of Congress during the summer of 2013. Okay. So Tom, you actually published a book on the subject. Um, how did that come about? Um, I had done a couple of articles for um, School Library Connection, which is connected with uh, this publisher through ABC Clio, and was having a conversation with um, one of the editors. And he said, you know, if you keep writing enough articles, you'll have enough for a book. And I said, I already have an idea for a book. <laughs> and he, and he, we had a little conversation about it. And a couple months later, someone contacted me and asked if I'd be interested in submitting a proposal. And probably a, almost a year and a half later, we had a nice, you know, print book that you can hold into your hand, in your hands. And uh, Tom has been nice enough to give one of those books away today, so we'll do that a little bit later. But first, let's uh, have you share from your uh, book on how to use primary sources. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours. Okay. All right. Just want to confirm, Shannon, that you can see that okay, because if you can, I'm sure everyone else can as well. Yeah. Beautiful. We'll go from here. Oh, I've got the wrong date on there. My apologies. I think I've got the right presentation. We'll make sure as we move forward here. So I just mentioned that that summer of 2013 was when I finally uh, figured out how to start using primary sources. And I spent the 2015-16 school year actually moving back to DC for the entire year and working as a teacher in residence with the Library of Congress and their Educational Outreach Division. And Shannon, you just mentioned that book that came uh, about January of 2019. But I really think all of the important things that I'm going to talk to you about today really come from the two years in between uh, the Summer Teacher Institute and me moving to DC and then those two plus years after and really the months since then. That's when all of the learning for me takes place. I do kind of get ideas and get inspiration during those other times. But working with the students and learning about using these documents uh, in the classroom and for student learning really is where that power happens. So one thing I always like to talk about is, is what is a primary source? Because I think that when we talk about primary sources, often we jump right into formats. We talk about old photographs and we talk about letters and we talk about diaries. Um, we often also talk about this idea of uh, somebody's firsthand account but when we start to look at other historical documents like uh, political cartoons and um, newspaper articles, that idea of it being a firsthand account gets a little bit tricky and they're formats that often kind of get left by the wayside. So I, 
I think that we need a really simple definition that we can give our students, whether they're at the elementary level, like my students are at the middle school or high school level. And I'm always thinking about that high school student who gets tasked by his uh, classroom teacher to do this research report. And the teacher says, make sure you have four primary sources, but doesn't say what that would entail. And the student has to have this kind of working definition of what that is. So my working definition is that a primary source is an item or an object directly connected to a topic of study and the related time period. And we talk about that all the time, even with second grade students, that what are we studying and that what we're studying and the time period when that happened is connected to these primary sources that we're looking at. I've had a chance to talk to, gosh, a couple hundred educators, and I often ask them, well, tell me what a primary source is to you and I specifically asked them to tell me without using uh, the idea, or without using formats as examples. So don't tell me it's an old photograph or a diary. And I think there's a couple of misconceptions that are out there. At least for me, I count them as misconceptions. The first one is this idea that sources are always primary or secondary. Um, in fact, I think it depends on what we're actually studying. Um, if we're studying a certain topic, that a source connected with it can be primary. Um, maybe, depending if it doesn't fit with the time period of when the event or the person was around, it might be considered secondary. And then we have a lot of things that aren't actually sources for our topics under study at all. So it doesn't, it doesn't always exist as a primary source. It depends on what we're studying. So when I'm talking with teachers initially, we look at historical documents. We don't start calling them primary sources until we actually are talking about what we are studying. The second misconception I think is that primary sources are fact while secondary sources are opinion. And we don't always say that primary sources are fact, but we often say, I often hear educators say secondary sources are other people's opinions of what happened. And the fact is, is that the, uh, the letters and the newspaper articles and the political cartoons, all of those are someone's opinion. In fact, the most interesting primary sources, the most engaging ones are often riddled with not just opinions, but straight up biases that are really interesting to dive into and uh, pick apart. That's what makes those things engaging. And the last misconception, I get a lot of pushback on this sometimes, is that primary sources are always firsthand accounts. And the reason I put this up as a misconception is that I think that when we tell students that a primary source is always a firsthand account, when they go back and they look at that newspaper article or they look at that political cartoon and they can't tell if the person was actually at the event, they just abandon it. And they miss using really engaging, rich pieces of history in their learning because they can't tell if the person was actually there at a particular event when they created the item. And so I think if you take that out of the equation and you just say, if the source is connected to, the, to what you're studying and it's from that time period, we're gonna count that as a primary source, it opens up all kinds of great opportunities for some rich learning. So, Wanted to lay that as a little bit of a foundation for how I uh, use primary sources or what I think a primary source is. And I want to talk briefly about why I use primary sources in student learning. And there's a whole lot of reasons that really benefit my students. These aren't unique to primary sources per se, but I think when I think about how primary sources are used in the classroom, we get some, some definite benefits. The first one is that it gives students ownership of their learning. Uh, we when we use primary sources in my school, when we use historical documents in my school, um, students are really in charge of making meaning from those historical documents. I give structure to that. We teach students how to do that, but students are in charge of how they interpret something. And we do this work collaboratively so that they're not you know, just off running rogue and having these misconceptions potentially. Those things are all checked through the learning process, but they walk away with, coming up with their own ideas, asking their own questions. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The other thing is it gives the opportunity for everyone to participate. When we use these analysis strategies, and we'll talk about one in just a few minutes, there are so many different entry points for students. There's so many different places where the student who usually stands back and lets someone else do a lot of the talking, but maybe doing his or her own thinking, gets a chance to enter into the learning with the rest of the group and really participate. There's lots of different opportunities where that can happen. It also gives them the opportunity to work with items that don't have all the answers. And I think there's definitely a place for 
for example, um, informational nonfiction text and um, different types of resources that we put in front of students that kind of, kind of have this nice and tidy beginning, middle, and end and kind of fully encompass what we want them to interact with. But I think there are other times where we need to give students things that they puzzle over and that they need to put other pieces together with a particular, for example, historical photograph, like in this picture, to actually make sense of what is happening. So in this photo, or in this picture that I've taken, for example, we've got uh, a mapping activity where the students are given historical photographs from a Thanksgiving dinner from the 50s. And all these photographs are actually taken from the same room. And my task to them was, can you take all of these photographs and make me a map of the room? It wasn't something that was necessarily um, right there in front of them. And actually, if you look at all the student products, when it's all said and done, they are all a little bit different because the students interpret those photographs a little bit different. They think certain things are more important than others. And so one student may include, for example, the calendar on the wall, while another student may not. And that's okay because um, what they're doing is making meaning or making sense from that picture and then demonstrating what they see from it and, and that, that meaning that they made from it. So it gives them the opportunity to work with these things that don't have simple answers. Um, along with that, it honors multiple perspectives. And I think I'm kind of have spoken to that to some degree, but we get to bring our own ideas, our own interpretations, and we have to share those collaboratively and work through that process. And I love the collaborative work that comes from primary source analysis because it's not just us expressing our ideas, it's us listening to other people's ideas do too and incorporating their ideas into our own understanding. And it's something that students do really naturally when we set them up in the right environment to do it. Another thing that I love is that analyzing a primary source helps students ask their own questions. And most importantly, they are questions that they want to find the answers to. So this, these questions that you can kind of see from this photograph are all questions that students had after analyzing a photograph of um, people who were constructing the Statue of Liberty. All kinds of wonderful questions, and we parlayed that into then our research, and this is at second grade, on the Statue of Liberty and how it was constructed and how it came to be. It's kind of looking at it as an American symbol, but the story of it actually coming into being. And I always say that you will never find a student more excited to find information in a book than when they're actually finding the answer to their own question. That is something that is engaging, that is exciting. They'll go and they'll share it with a classmate. They wanna share it with you. Um, they're making connections because they own that question and it's not something that we just handed to them. So again, can we do that in a way that encourages them to ask questions that has to do with maybe content that we are already wanting them to interact with? Primary sources can be a way to do that. Tom, I love what you're saying there about that. I think it's that's such an important part of research, um, but I think it's also something that scares teachers. Like yeah. when, when the kids have to try to come up with answers for their own questions, they may struggle more to find those answers and we may not be as equipped to help them. Um, and so I think that's scary for us as, as the educators, but you know, it's so meaningful once they do actually find that answer. And one thing that I talk about in the book, Shannon, and I think you're 100% right, um, one thing I talk about in the book is this idea, and this really came from uh, the book Energizing Research, um, and Victoria and I know that book well, we've done book studies on it, um, is that students, when they ask their own, or when they ask questions, or when they want to, to dive more into a topic that they want to study, when they have the autonomy to make that choice of what that is, part of owning that is also owning the idea that they may not find the answer to every question they ask. And that's okay, that's kind of built into the process. Um, what I've always found is that even though students don't always find the answers to all their questions, the engagement also comes when they find the answers to other students' questions, when they find new information that they find engaging that causes more questions to come about. And so I think the one thing that um, I encourage teachers to do when they have that fear that you expressed is to anticipate what do you think some of the questions might be and 
if these are the questions, what kind of resources can we offer students or point them towards to start to look towards those answers? We, it does ask us to be more nimble than if we were just feeding them the questions and feeding them the information where they can find the answers to the questions. You're 100% right, but it's definitely more authentic and um, more engaging at the same time. Thank you. And this, the last reason are, that, I, that I really like using primary sources in student learning is it gives students a framework to think independently. Any primary source analysis strategy, and I, I share five different ones in the book, and I've got variations for all of the strategies in the book as well, where you can use it with specific formats or specific ages of students. Um, all of them are really just structured uh, thinking processes, and they are not exclusive to using with historical documents. Um, as a matter of fact, some of my favorites actually come from uh, thinking processes that were found outside uh, diff in different learning environments, and I brought them in and thought, oh, this would work really great with primary sources. And so when we provide students, students those simplified structures, and they can take them and see them um, repeatedly being used in other areas as well, I think it not only helps them um, moving forward from um, year to year to year in school, but it also helps them outside of school. It helps them to look at things in a different way and analyze their, their world in a different way. And I think that's a powerful piece that, that this can bring to students. So just, I wanted to just mention real briefly about selecting compelling primary sources. I often tell teachers that there's tens of millions, hundreds of millions of historical items out there but they aren't all compelling. You wanna choose things that students are going to be uh, interested in. There's a few places that I like to go. These are some of them, Library of Congress, Digital Public Library of America. Down in the left corner there, uh, the Missouri History Museum Library Research Center. You may not have access to that if you're outside of the St. Louis area, but looking at local institutions as well, I think uh, there, there's just a, a, a rich uh, offerings that, that are often available. And I've never met, a librarian or an archivist at any of these places that doesn't just bend over backwards to help um, educators, school librarians with this finding, in, uh, finding things that are gonna be great for their students. Um, when I'm thinking about putting all these pieces together, I actually kind of have three areas that I'm, I'm thinking of. This idea of compelling primary sources, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, a strategy for analysis, and I mentioned that earlier, we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, and the idea of it integrating into other learning, that we don't analyze any primary sources in a silo, that all of this connects to other learning. So let me dive into this for just a couple of minutes. Um, primary sources that are compelling, I think, fall into these few categories. Um, that First of all, that students, one way that it might be compelling is students connect to the source. There's something that they see in it that they, they know, that they connect with. Um, the, su the source is well known or familiar. Um, at the same time that the source makes them wonder. So if it's too familiar, um, there's nothing to wonder about and it may not be engaging or compelling. If it is too foreign to them though, if there's nothing to connect with, it's gonna be too confusing and they don't want to interact with it because they don't know where to go with it. So it kind of has to have a balance of those things. It may be that the source is in a particular format. I've got students who love working with maps, for example. So that might be something that I want to really make an effort to bring in. And sometimes it's that the source elicits a, an emotional reaction. Uh, it may make them happy. Uh, sometimes it makes them frustrated or angry, especially when you're dealing, for example, if you're looking at sources around the civil rights period, um, that, that could, you could be putting things in front of them that are going to elicit some kind of emotion. And um, recognizing that and, and working through that is, as part of the analysis process is important. So I want to just real briefly, and I know I just have a few minutes here, go through one very, very quick example as an illustrative thing. Um, this is a book, and I do a lot of work with picture books and primary sources. I've got a blog um, post that go through AASL's Knowledge Quest blog that go up monthly. Um, this one has to do with the creation of the earmuffs. And so um, with this one, the compelling primary sources that I brought in were actually the patents for different kind of ear coverings. And th these are mentioned in the book. It was just a process of actually digging them up and finding them. If you look at the blog post, I've got links to all of these available. Um, I thought that these were interesting. When I see the one on the right with the, um, the ear covers that just slip on and either go under the chin or behind the back, like that seems 
odd and different and yet at the same time familiar. And so what we did, these are a couple more of them that are out and about in the old patent world that you can find. This one is particularly engaging, I guess. This one's uh, covering not only the nose, but the cheeks and the ears as well. You get kind of a three for, for that piece. Um, we've got students and teachers doing very specific roles when they're doing primary source analysis. Uh, the teacher is going to frame the analysis. They're gonna kind of create the sandbox that students are going to work in. And they're gonna provide students an analysis strategy. Now this is when we're, we're beginning. When we have high school students that have done this over and over again, they might be choosing an analysis strategy that works for them, but only after they're familiar with them. We're gonna provide guidance to students to kind of help them stay on a general path, and we're going to help them connect that analysis to other learning. Students are gonna work within the teacher's framework and uh, follow those strategies and then use the analysis to inform their own learning. So with this piece, to frame the analysis, one way I might do this is to give a phrase like this about we're gonna analyze a primary source connected to this book we just read, and we're gonna try to understand how something was made so that we can try to improve upon it. So we're gonna look at this idea of these uh, earmuffs and we're gonna try to improve upon something that was already made. Now, this is a different way we might frame the analysis. Um, we're gonna analyze primary source connected to the book we just read, and we're gonna try to understand what's special about a patent drawing so we can create our own. So these are two different ways, and there's more, right? But these are two different ways that we might frame this particular analysis. And when we frame the analysis, what we're doing as a teacher is we're encouraging students to focus their attention in certain areas of the primary source. Um, if not, they can go all over the place and they're gonna go in unexpected directions anyway, but the more we can start to guide them in a certain direction, that's gonna help us connect that experience to the future learning that we're uh, working on with them. So students are gonna see certain things. If we talk about, tell me what this looks like as a patent drawing, they may be looking at the letters and the wording and the perspective, but if I ask them to try to understand this so we can improve upon it, they're probably gonna be more focused on the actual image itself and maybe how it's actually going to work. Um, so that we're gonna look at these things in different ways depending on how we frame the analysis. And then we're gonna ask students to do three different things. We're gonna ask them to make an observation, talk to me about what you see, we're gonna ask them to react to it, talk to me about what you're thinking about this, and then what questions do they have? And this is from the Library of Congress. They call it observe, reflect, question. I call it see, think, wonder. Um, it works, um, it, it's not a linear path. We always start with observations, but students jump around all over the place. Students might start asking questions right away or reacting to the primary source right away um, or making those observations that we want them to. But ultimately, we want them to spend time in all three of these places. And so as we do that, this, I might prompt them to kind of move in a direction. So if I wanna prompt them to make observations, I might be saying, well, what do you see in this drawing that seems important to you? That's gonna prompt them to look closely at things and make observations. Uh, if I wanna prompt them to, to ask questions, I might say, well, what, what questions does this make you wonder about? Uh, something as simple as that gets them asking questions. So it's another role that the teachers play in getting them, in getting students to kind of interact with the source in the way that you want in, that you want them to. So here is an example of connecting the analysis to other learning. So we decided to do this as a maker activity, and we had students actually after they did their analysis then go and start to design their own. Um, ear coverings. And some of them, as you can see from that drawing of the face, also incorporated the nose covering. So they're incorporating elements that they see in other primary, in, in these sources, but they're trying to improve upon them or make them um, current in some way or appealing in some way to them today. And then we had students actually then making um, actual models. So we had them with chipboard and felt um, and cotton actually sewing these pieces together. They were actually making these things. Um, and it was, it was essentially a, a lesson in, in design. And so uh, this was a, a great activity that, that the students really connected with. And then you've got some students who of course are wearing their own makeshift you know, ear coverings out. This was during the winter. They were uh, maybe keeping their ear, ears warm as they, were, as they were doing this. So connecting it to that learning, that, that primary source analysis has a purpose. 
So just to kind of look back, um, this, this really kind of fits in, in just a nutshell, like a 25 minute nutshell of, of not only why I use primary sources with students and, and a little peek at what that looks like, but also just a, a kind of a scratching the surface of, of the book, uh, Elementary Educator's Guide to Primary Sources uh, that I put out there. My, my intention was just to give um, a glimpse at, at what this looked like in my library and to really kind of break down the thinking to um, hopefully uh, help people start to use these types of resources uh, with their students. Thank you, Tom. Um, I have, I really like uh, the structures that you talked about. I can see that the students have voice and choice. You've prompted curiosity um, and allowed them to take ownership and a lot of collaboration. Um, between students so I can hear or I can envision in my head just the positive and engaging chatter that would be going on in your library. Um, I'm wondering what advice do you have for the secondary um, at secondary educators because I can see where a lot of the things that you talked about really could grow and yeah. also help them. Yeah, I, I, I'm glad you asked that. One thing that I, I did really intentionally when I wrote the book, the publisher was specifically looking for a, an elementary focus because there's not a lot out there for elementary educators on this topic. Um, but I also knew that the things that we were doing, um, I, I've had conversations and come in and done little guest teachings at, at, at middle schools as well. And, and I know that the, the same strategies apply. It looks different, obviously. Um, what we expect from students and the level of, of depth of thinking, uh, critical thinking looks different, um, but the same structures work. And so I really purposely wrote this book um, to work for a middle school as well. If you take about eight pages out of this book, it is, it, I, and rip the cover off, it works for middle schools. And I've had high school librarians um, contact me and say, we've used this book at, for our high school, at our high school, and I've shared these strategies out with teachers and they work wonderfully. Um, so it, it's, it's more of a matter of shifting what we're expecting um, to see from students, and that shifts greatly from kindergarten up through fifth grade, and you can see that it would continue to shift even though we're using some of those same analysis strategies and same approaches of, of student engagement, of co collaboration, and student ownership of work. Those things stay front and center, just, just like you identified. Okay, and I know Tom has worked with some of the teachers in my building. We're middle school and we've worked with you um, and those are just now becoming part of the natural practice for the teachers. So that's a really wonderful um, thing and and I've learned so much also from you, Tom, and now I know I'm super interested in earmuffs. I never knew that would. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks okay. for sharing. Yeah, thank you, Tom. This has been great. So I know everyone that's watching probably is ready to go get a copy of your book. So let's give one away. Can you pick a number between two and 22 for me, Tom? Oh, man. Um, I'm going to pick eight. Okay. Number eight is Laura Laramore from uh, Bayless. So congratulations, right. Laura. Congratulations, Laura. Woohoo. All right. Uh, well, that it wraps it up for this session. We have uh, four more after this, though. So thank you so much for joining us today for this first session of our uh, mini conference. And coming up next, we have the year of being told yes. So um, hopefully everyone will jump out of this session and jump into the next link. And we'll see you soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye.